Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fourth talk about creativity. As discussed in earlier sessions, creativity requires raw materials. It also requires energy. Our body gets raw materials and energy from the foods that we eat. This brings us to the discussion we've been having about the digestive system. Food moves through the tube we call our digestive tract from mouth to anus. As it moves, the food is broken down to constituent molecules. These are absorbed into the bloodstream and are then available for use by the body. So far, we've looked at how food enters the mouth and is broken down by chewing and getting dissolved in saliva, which also begins the process of enzyme degradation. We've looked at how food then moves down the esophagus and through the stomach using muscular action that is coordinated by a sophisticated gut nervous system and develops a kind of motion referred to as peristalsis. Today we'll follow food further as it travels through the small and large intestine, also known as the colon, and as it accumulates prior to release as undigested material in the substance we call feces. We'll see how bacteria participate in the digestive process in a collaborative way and thus assist our bodies in this profound and important work of digestion. Let's begin. So we have this human body and as discussed in earlier talks, we think of it as coming in a certain form. Of course, the details of that form vary by age, biological sex, genetic background, life history, etc. But as a general body plan, we think of a solid organism with a torso, four limbs, and a head, such as we see here. And yet, through the center of the torso from mouth to anus, there is this tube. And so it would be reasonable to consider the body as possessing a kind of tubular geometry. And it's this inner tube that we've been looking at in this series, the digestive tube. Along the way, we've also looked at how we can consider the body from the aspect of our human intelligence. So we have this powerful human brain that is capable of conceptualizing, telling stories, and doing science. A lot of what's offered in the Mindful Biology series relates to the work of the brain body and its creativity and its capacity for understanding. But that's not the whole story when it comes to how we experience life. There's also a relational quality that has less to do with our ideas, our stories, and our language, and more about an immediate, felt, and we could say intuitive relationship in real time. So just about everything that comes our way is rather rapidly assessed as being something that feels helpful or harmful or neutral. And this feeling tone is what I'm referring to as the work of the heart body. But then there's what I've called the earth body, the direct, felt, tangible sense of having a body with all of its sensations and perceptions. This is the starting point and it feeds into the actions that occur in the heart body and brain body. So we first have some kind of experience that is direct and very biological. It's quickly assessed in a relational way, and then it's almost as rapidly 
assessed in a conceptual way. So the earth body experience becomes relational as the heart body assesses, and then it becomes conceptual as the brain body analyzes. In today's talk, as we move through the intestines and particularly down to the end point of digestion, that is to say defecation, we'll be getting very much in touch with this earth body, that direct sensory experience. And the earthiness of this lower body has another meaning. That is to say that what comes out of the body after the digestive process has been completed connects us with the earth, roots us in the earth in a very tangible and important way, as we shall see. Now the body is constructed. First, it's constructed in the womb from a fertilized egg to a fetus to a newborn infant. And then later in life, as the body grows and maintains itself. A house is also constructed. It's much simpler than a human body, but it will serve to make the point that any constructed system is constructed with a kind of process. And it doesn't come into being all at once. It is, in effect, built. And it's built from raw materials. So the workmen that built this brick house needed bricks. Now, probably the bricks were formed from clay dug from the earth and baked in a kiln. But they could have also come from a previously constructed building that was demolished and broken down into its constituent bricks, which could then be reused to build the house. And our bodies use a process much like this. We eat some other life form which has been built either through the photosynthetic activity of plants or through some other biological digestive system in an animal but one way or another, we eat a life form and break it down into its constituent molecules. Those molecules are, in effect, the bricks from which our body is built. And those bricks then are retrieved, harvested in our digestive system, along with the energy that we need to do all this building. So we have this digestive tract and food enters it. And in the stomach, it is bathed in acid and enzymes. There's a solution that comes out of the glands in the stomach that has effectively hydrochloric acid in it and a lot of what are called enzymes that continue the enzymatic digestion that was started up in the mouth with the glandular secretion we call saliva. Now, there is also a liver and a pancreas that participate in digestion. The pancreas is particularly important because it is the source of a great many more enzymes that add to the ones secreted by the stomach. The liver does a number of things, but one of them is to develop a kind of detergent referred to as bile. This is stored in the gallbladder and is released when there is fatty food in the digestive system. And just like detergent breaks down the oil on dishes or in clothing, this detergent that our body produces breaks down the oils and fats that we eat. Now, enzymes are very important in all of this, and I want to take a little time explaining how an enzyme works. And perhaps many of us already know, but just in case, I want to be very clear about how an enzyme functions. So we have some kind of food molecule. It could be, for instance, a protein. And then there's a very large molecule made by the body referred to as an enzyme. This consists of a protein with perhaps uh, some other chemicals that assist the protein. Now, the protein that is an enzyme has a particular shape which is designed through evolution to match very closely the shape of the food molecule 
at particular points. And so the enzyme can dock, as it were, with the food molecule. This brings it into close contact with the active region of the enzyme, which then works a kind of chemical magic that breaks a chemical bond and separates the food molecule into two parts. These are breakdown products, and they may undergo further enzymatic degradation to be broken down further. Now the beauty of an enzyme is that it is reusable and can very rapidly break down a great many molecules. So here we have our enzyme, and here's our food molecule, and it can go up and turn into breakdown products, and then the enzyme can work on another, and another food molecule, and another, and so on. So that's the basis of enzymatic digestion. And clearly, enzymes are very important. And as mentioned, they are present in saliva. They come out of the glands along the stomach lining and from the pancreas. Some are also secreted by the small intestine. But even all of those enzymes are not sufficient. The body depends on enzymes that come from yet another source, and that source is bacteria. So the bacteria that live in the digestive system produce a very wide range of enzymes that help us digest foods. Bacteria can also generate vitamins that we are unable to synthesize on our own. So bacteria are important components in digestion. So the role of bacteria in digestion is currently a topic of active research and discussion. It turns out there are many, many different kinds of bacteria in our gut, hundreds, perhaps thousands. And they are present in vast numbers. It's hard to get a really accurate estimate, but roughly it's thought to be between 100 and 1,000 trillion individual bacterial cells in each of our guts. And for comparison, there are about 10 to 40 trillion human cells in the entire body. So just in our gut, we have many times as many bacterial cells as we do human cells in the whole body. And this is possible because bacterial cells are very, very small compared to human cells. Now those bacteria are present throughout the gut, but particularly in the intestines and especially in the large intestine or colon. As food moves through the intestines, these bacteria help break it down. They assist the body in degrading the foods that we eat into the constituent molecules. This is very important work. And the capacity of bacteria to perform chemical degradation far exceeds the capacity of our human cells. That is to say, the bacteria bring a kind of intelligence to bear into the system that adds to the intelligence of our human cells and our human body. So to think about this in another way, let's consider that food enters the mouth, moves down the esophagus, through the stomach, and then travels as it breaks down through the small intestine and the large one. When it gets to the large intestine, the rate of movement slows down because the large intestine is, as the name implies, larger, and so the flow through it tends to be slower. What's happening is that a kind of fermentation process is underway. By slowing down and sitting in the large intestine for periods of time, the bacteria is allowed to work on the digesting food and have the opportunity to break it down further. Just like this sauerkraut that's being fermented here benefits from being allowed to sit in jars with microorganisms for extended periods of time. Now, as I mentioned, this business of how the gut is assisted by bacteria with what we call the microbiome is an active area of research. And many textbooks have been written 
that are based on thousands of research articles. And even more books have been written for the general public. And some of the books have been written for children. And the children's books, in a way, capture something much more quickly and elegantly than the more detailed and technical books are capable of. So this title, A Garden in Your Belly, says something very important about this relationship between the human organism and the bacterial organisms that live within it. They are, in effect, a kind of garden or ecosystem we carry around with us. And so we can imagine this profuse, very fertile field of life within our digestive system, within our bellies. I think this mindset can help us when we deal with the inevitable feelings of discomfort and embarrassment around defecation and this lower part of the body. Clearly, people have had some concerns about this aspect of human biology for a very long time, and many religions deal with our sense of shame and our discomfort with our animal nature. Now, some of that clearly has to do with sexuality, but some of it, I believe, also has to do with this stuff that comes out the far end of our digestive tract, this stuff we call feces. Now, it's helpful to take a more objective look at the feces and not think about it in human and cultural terms and, you know, what does it mean in terms of our cleanliness or purity or anything like that, and just think about how does this stuff that exits our body connect us to the earth at large? And one way to get a handle on that is to look again at these gut bacteria, the gut microbiome. Here we're seeing a picture of them under an electron microscope. Superficially, they look very similar to the bacteria that are in the soil. And in fact, there is a microbiome in the soil that is also an area of active research. But the interesting thing is that the species of bacteria present in the gut are often very similar to the species present in the soils around us. I actually learned this fact in one of my first classes in medical school. A professor was describing the bacteria in the digestive system, and he made this direct comparison with the bacteria in the soil. And that was back in the early 1980s, so this is not terribly new information, although it's been extended quite a bit from what was known then. But it does remind us that there is this relationship and this similarity between what comes out of our bodies at the far end of the digestive tract and where that material goes, which is to say back to the soil of the green and growing parts of the earth. So we are returning something to the earth every time we defecate. Now this doesn't mean that we're so to speak, pooping on the earth in a negative sense of the word. I mean, certainly people, that is to say human civilization, is not treating the earth very well at the present time. But this process of returning fecal material to the earth is not in the same category as industrial pollution. It's much sweeter and more supportive and more ecological than that. It's a necessary and vital part of the living cycle. Now, we aren't as aware of this, probably, as people might have been long ago. Tens of thousands of years ago, all humans lived more or less like the people we see here. These days, this lifestyle is very rare in numerical terms, but it used to be the way of life for all of us, or for all of our ancestors. And so what's going on here? Well, we have people living very close to the earth and to the soil. And of course, being people and having digestive tracts, they are pooping, and the poop comes out, and it lands in the soil, and the bacteria in the poop settle back into the soil where they came from in the first place. And that soil is all around. These people are not washing their hands with antibacterial soap on a regular basis. 
they are very intimately connected with the earth and they are thus often touching the soil and picking up the bacteria that are in it and conveying those bacteria back into their bodies. So people to poop to soil to people is a common cycle. And of course the soil is also in contact with the plants and prey that the people eat as well as the water that they drink. And so the bacteria are moving around and around in these ways. Now today we live in much different ways. We don't connect with the soil nearly so intimately and our fecal material is and our fecal material is flushed away from our local environment. There are of course many advantages to this hygiene. It protects us from infection. It makes for a cleaner and more comfortable lifestyle. So much has been gained with all of our sanitation, but something has also been lost. And what's been lost is that intimacy, that ever-present reminder of our connection to the earth. And so we have to work harder to remember our connection to the earth than people did tens of thousands of years ago. But that connection remains that there is soil all around us and in effect there is soil within us and there is a continuing cycle that connects what's within to what's outside. One way to get a reminder of this is to return again to this waste product that comes out of our bodies. So very frequently we defecate and deposit waste back into the environment. That waste comes out of what we call an anus and prior to leaving the body, it's stored in what we call a rectum, a kind of temporary receiving chamber. So we have the rectum and the anus. We're also familiar with the idea of a sphincter that controls the movement of the material within the rectum out through the anus at chosen times. And we can tell when there is a fullness in the rectum and then we can choose when to release the material in our bodies and return it to the earth. And so that material is something we don't like to talk about, we certainly you know, don't want to touch, we don't like the way it smells and so on, but there is a sense in which it is very intimately and tangibly connecting us to the earth, reminding us as it were that the earth is not only outside of us, it's also within us. If we turn all of this on its side and stretch it out a bit, it's reminiscent of the little creature that we've introduced several times now, the earthworm, which, if you'll recall, survives by burrowing through the soil and drawing that soil into its digestive tract as it goes. And so the soil moves down the digestive tube, which fills much of the interior of the earthworm's body. And the organic material within the soil is broken down, further decomposed. The earthworm thus harvests raw materials and energy needed for its own body. And then it defecates a fecal product which enriches the soil. Well, we are not all that different. We take in products from the earth that we call food, plant life or animal life that feeds on plants. And that material which is of the earth travels through our own digestive tube and becomes ever more soil-like until it exits the body again and returns to the earth at large. But particularly in that area prior to defecation that we call the rectum, we can get that sense that there is something within us that is very much of the earth, very much like soil, and that can serve as a quite tangible reminder of how the earth is not only all around us, but that it is also within us, and that we are in fact part of the earth ourselves. 
Thus, the digestive tract, and particularly the lower ends of it, remind us of our deeply rooted relationship with the earth. And this can be a felt experience that can fuel very powerful meditative and contemplative practices. To close this video, I'll offer a brief description of a meditation practice that connects us with our lower body and with the earth below. Feel into your sitting bones where they contact whatever you're sitting upon. Feel how the body is held supported by the earth. Feel into the tissues around the sitting bones, the hip joints, the thighs, the lower back, Feel the front of the body. Just above the pelvic bone in the front. Feel the area of the sacrum behind. Feel the tissues between the front of the body above the pelvic bone and the sacrum in the back of the body. Feel that whole area between the hips within the pelvic region. Remember that within that region There is something much like soil waiting to return to the earth. See if you can feel the earth beneath your sitting bones as if it were part of this same earth that's within your lower body. As if there's a region of you that extends from the pelvic area down into the earth. Getting the sense of earth within and earth outside. And when you are done, simply open your eyes, wiggle your fingers and toes, breathe a little faster and deeper, and return to your active day.